And I'm going to let John take this off. John. Oh, wow. Yeah. You're going to let me drive. Yeah, that's right. That's fantastic. Lisa, um, great to have you. Uh, and I just want to start off. The chip industry and the shortages are just kind of top of mind for everybody. So when is supply going to catch up with demand? Right. Well, first of all, um, Kara, thank you so much for, no problem. for having, uh, having me here. It's great to see John again. We're uh, old friends that talk often. So. Uh, look, you know, um, for those of us in the semiconductor industry, it's uh, it's quite an experience to have you know semiconductors be in the headlines everywhere. So we get it. Uh, there's a supply shortage. You know what um, what's important for people to remember is you know the pandemic has just um, just taken demand to um, a new level. Like we, nobody expected this much demand, and frankly, I think it's a great thing. I mean, what it says is that everybody needs chips, no matter what you're doing, whether it's your business, your work, you know, your home, your, um, you know, your large enterprises, and so on and so forth. Um, we have to catch up. And, so and it hasn't cooled off, right? Like it has not cooled off. I would say demand has, you know, if you think about the semiconductor industry, we've always gone through cycles of ups and downs where you know, demand has exceeded supply or vice versa. This time it's different. And what's different this time is every industry needs more. And so, you know, the confluence of that means that uh, there, is a, there is an imbalance. I will say that there's a tremendous amount of investment going in. So uh, there are, you know, over 20 new factories that are coming online this year and, and you know, 20 more, you know, 20 plus more in, um, uh, in planning. And um, so it's still going to be tight. You know, this year's tight. First half of next year, likely tight, but it'll get better as we get into That's 2022. Where, where are the shortages from your perspective? What is the, what, you broke it down. And, and how it occurred was the demand in the pandemic was that people wanted what? So when you, um, like for example, I can you know, talk a little bit about you know, sort of the PC industry, right? right? People were thinking that you know, PCs were actually a flat to declining market. You know, they weren't the sexy things you know, necessarily. Uh, flash to the pandemic and all of a sudden, you know, this is the way you communicate. And when you were communicating for an hour or two, maybe you could do it on a, on a phone or a tablet. When you're communicating like you know, 10 hours a day, you need a different form factor. And so we've seen a significant increase in demand there. Um, you know, enterprises you know, trying to really get all of their employees um, you know, connected. Um, you know, we've seen um, some stuff about automotive shortages because there were some supply chain interruptions there. So it's just every market has seen the demand go up. And, um, and the key here with these complex supply chains is you may need thousands of chips. You know, only one of them being short is going to cause you to not ship your system. And so there's just a lot of, let's call it, um, mixing and matching of, of these things. But you know, what I will say is it will be solved. Okay, we, <laughs> the semiconductor industry has been through these things, and it, it will absolutely um, you know, uh, normalize uh, supply to demand. And when do you expect that to happen? I, I would say it gets better next year. You know, not, not, um, not immediately, but it will gradually get better as uh, more and more plants come up. And it takes, you know, we're an industry that just takes a long time to get anything done. So, you know, it might take, you know, 18 to 24 months to put on a new plant, and in some cases even longer than that. And so, you know, these investments were started uh, perhaps a year ago. And so they're, they're coming online you know, as, we, as we go through uh, the next couple of quarters. So let's talk a little bit about your development cycle, because one of the um, things you did, I, people don't know you that well, although what's happened at AMD has been pretty remarkable. Um, this is a company, what was the shares selling for? About 108 uh, a, sh a share now. Yeah. But when Lisa started, about three. Three dollars a share. Yeah. So explain <laughs> now. One of the pretty things, good. one of the pretty things, good. pretty good. Um, one of the things, you're one of the highest paid women executives, uh, but, but not, but one of the, the 40th highest paid executive, which sort of burned my ass kind of thing, <laughs> and why that was with this kind of performance. But talk a little bit about what you did, because some of it was, it was removing your manufacturing. Talk a little bit about that journey of bringing that up. Yeah, so um, you know, I'm an engineer by training. So you know, grew up in the semiconductor industry from the the R and D side. And one of the things about our business is uh, you have to s decide what you want to do like five years in advance. 
right? So whether it's you know, what markets, what products, what technology, and, and actually you have to make choices about those technologies. And so, you know, with AMD, I mean, look, um, I love the company. Uh, I, I, I say this, I'll say this, you know, with all, um, uh, you know, honesty, it's, it's my dream job to, to be, um, you know, the head of a, a large semiconductor company. And uh, there was a time when, you know, we weren't putting out products like you should. And at the end of the day, you know, tech companies are about products. So you have to put out great products. And so uh, we have, uh, you know, over the past uh, six or seven years, um, you know, we've really focused on what we're good at, which is, you know, I always believed that computing would become extremely important. Sort of, you know, if you think about what would drive a society, it's, uh, it's high performance computing. And so that's where we put, you know, the eggs in those baskets. There were things that we didn't do. You know, we're not in phones. As, as, as much as everyone has their phone, we're not in phones. And that's okay, because that's not our specialty. Um, you know, we did make some choices, you know, not, uh, not doing our own manufacturing, really focused on design. And, and why did you do that? Why did you think that way? You know, the, the truth is that um, for, for the size of company that we were, we needed to focus on where we could be the absolute best. And uh, scale is important in, um, in manufacturing. And, um, you know, we just didn't think we could be the best at that. So we wanted to partner uh, with, um, you know, others who could be very, you know, very good partners and focus on where we could be the best, which is in, you know, semiconductor design and advanced uh, technology. I think maybe you're being a little bit too humble about it, because uh, AMD used to be like the San Jose Sharks, like one of those teams that'd be really good during the regular season and fall apart in the playoffs, right? So it was like, you'd have good product, but couldn't quite get it over the... So, and, and just, a li I know you don't like talking about Lisa Sue, but let's talk about Lisa Sue for a minute. Um, you grew up in Queens, right? In 1984, you were at Bronx Science with John Favreau and Min Jin Lee, right? <laughs> that would have been a great team. You should have gotten together and done something. <laughs> but like, what's the Queens aspect of how you've run AMD and managed to win consistently when it counted? Well, well look, I mean, I don't know what you guys believe, but I always believe um, you can put together a great team. With, with great leadership and great vision for where you want to go. And you know, for us at AMD, look, um, we love what we do. Right? We're about pushing the envelope on technology. And what I needed to get the team thinking about is it's not like just what we did to do today. It's you know, customers and partners want to be able to believe in you, you know, for the next five years or the next 10 years and build those deep partnerships. And so, you know, honestly, John, we were patient, right? I mean, I told the guys, look, it's going to take us five years, but we're going to build the best roadmap in the industry, and I believe we can do it with the right choices. Um, but, you know, you can't rush semiconductors. So what's the, what's the pandemic translation of that then? Because right now, long-term plans are hard, harder to make, right? Like, you can, people have been saying, all right, hurry, what can you get me tomorrow? But then when you're thinking about, okay, three to five years out, what do we need? So how do you translate what you did that was successful then into what companies and technology companies need to do now? I, I think if there's one lesson for us all to learn about the pandemic is you have to think about the long term. And you have to think about sort of the various contingencies that are required. Because all of these things that we never expected to happen have happened. <laughs> And, um, and so it is a mindset shift, uh, but I think people are very open to it. I think, you know, uh, I, like the collaboration that I see across the industry, like when we talk about supply chain, right, we have had um, the deepest conversations with our partners. You know, Satya is going to be here later. He's a yeah, great Microsoft, partner. Microsoft, App, um, Yeah, I mean, they're all great partners <coughs> uh, because you got to solve this together, right? There's no one company that's going to be able to do this, you know, all by themselves. All right, when you think about that, though, um, I'd love some thoughts on um, the Biden administration has been doing to support the competitiveness of American chip companies, and that will lead us into China and the worries about IP theft and the building of their semiconductor industry. Um, talk a little bit about it. You just joined a, a, a panel, and at the same time, three years ago, you were getting a lot of pushback from, the, uh, from uh, regulators over your relationship with China itself. Yeah, no, it's um, look, a great uh, a great point. I think the um, the work that's you know the conversation that's being had today about um, you know um, the semiconductor ecosystem, the essential nature of the semiconductor ecosystem, 
Um, you know, there is a CHIPS Act that, that has been passed. Um, and as from a national security From a national security standpoint and from, you know, just a supply resiliency standpoint, right? Just back to the, you know, you have to plan for every contingency. So um, I think we're very supportive of that and we're supportive of that because it does build a stronger semiconductor ecosystem and it should be there. Um, you know, I'm very honored to be on, uh, you know, the presidential uh, council that uh, was just recently announced. I think the, the fact that we can have a conversation about, again, back to long-term needs and um, how do you support and, and really, uh, uh, you know, promote innovation, um, I think is a great thing. Um, you know, back to your, your question about China care, I, I would say that the world has changed. And, you know, the world has evolved a bit from this notion of, you know, six or seven years ago, I think there was a, a notion of, hey, um, you know, let's focus on sort of economic growth. And, you know, we're all business people, right? I mean, you know, companies get bigger, you can spend more on R&D, you can get stronger, so on and so forth. Um, and then I think the most recent conversation is around how can we do both, right? How can we protect national security, because we all want to do that, um, as well as still participate in a free market. And, um, and that means that some technologies, you know, we really do have to keep, uh, you know, more uh, proprietary. Hmm. So when you look at what's going on in China right now, the crackdown on the tech industry, the growth of their semiconductor industry, accusations of IP theft, how do you think we should be dealing with the Chinese? Well, yeah, there, there is certainly a lot going on there. Um, I, I think what I would say, you know, again, um, looking at it from a broad perspective, I think, you know, decoupling isn't the answer. Um, you know, the, the, the world is very intertwined and supply chains are very intertwined. And, and frankly, innovation is um, really is, uh, um, uh, you know, sort of encouraged when you, you get people with different ideas together. Um, that being the case, I think you know, national security, um, you know, IP protections, um, you know, ensuring that, uh, you know, that's very well understood. And, you know, as a CEO, and maybe some of these, these uh, some of our audience can feel the same way, I think we, we want to work together with, uh, you know, the government on, on defining, you know, sort of, you know, what's the right balance, because it is a balancing act. There's not, you know, you can't go, you know, sort of student body left or student body right, because it, it's just too disruptive to, uh, you know, to, to everything. Are you worried about the advances their industries have made in this area? You know, I, I actually, um, don't think about it that way. I think about it as I always believe that the way to win is to run faster, right? You, you have to expect uh, the competition is going to be strong, uh, whether it's another country or another company. Or, and, um, you know, we have to believe that, you know, you know, the U.S. is the leader in semiconductor design today. We want to continue that. And, and so we have to run faster. And, uh, you know, that's, that's a part of, you know, sort of all of this discussion about strengthening the ecosystem. It seems to me like the Huawei 5G situation is just untenable going forward. Like when I look at the semiconductor industry, like the, the most important chip company, you know, that, that nobody talks about is ASML, right? That's in Europe. Um, I shouldn't say nobody talks about it. Very few people outside the semiconductor industry talk about. Uh, you got you guys in the US, you got all this manufacturing in, in Taiwan. You, I mean, it, it's spread all over the place. It's necessarily global. So how do, we, how does the industry get in place the, the checks, the security um, procedures, so that you can be sure that a product that's shipped from, whether it's China or wherever, is secure for use in the U EU, in North America, that the American government isn't sneaking stuff into equipment that's being sent to China, et cetera? Yeah, um, security absolutely is a foundation. We all have to trust the chips that we are building and buying. Um, I will say it's an area where there's a, um, a tremendous amount of collaboration amongst all of us in the industry. So it's things like, how do we get um, better hardware security so that actually, even if you're in a cloud provider, that they, they can't access your data. Um, it's things like, uh, you know, how do we make sure that you know, the software is more secure? How do we you know, look at those? So I think security absolutely is a foundation um, for that. And as an industry, you know, it's, it's something that we're very focused on. So let's talk a little bit about industry consolidation. Um, and some tech companies are thinking about producing semiconductors in-house. Is that a threat to AMD? Uh, 
I don't think so. I don't think of it that way, Kara. I would say that um, you know, all of us have our strategies for what we think are um, uh, you know what you think is the right path going forward. The thing that's so interesting about the semiconductor industry today is you know like five years ago people said we were boring. Right? Yeah. I mean we were the maturing industry, you know, low single digit growth and and so on and so forth. Um, and I think the world has has really realized that you know this is now an essential part of everything that we do. And so I believe there's um, significant growth um, for for the industry, not just from the standpoint of you know shipping more units, but doing more for the world and doing more to um, you know to really impact people's lives. And as part of that, you're going to pick what you're good at. And so I think there's good secular growth for the industry and. You know, our place in that is, you know, we're going to be a leader in high performance design and others may want to, you know, do their own manufacturing and that's okay. I, I think that answer was a good luck with that, right? <laughs> I did so, not say that, you right, said okay, that. All right. Okay. But, but in a way, hasn't customization become part of your strategy? Like you've got chips in the PS5, yeah. right, in the Xbox. Those aren't the off the shelf chips that you would put in a PC though rumor has it it's going the other way now and you're taking some PS5 chips that didn't quite work out and putting them into PCs, right? We use, okay. we use chips everywhere. Right, okay, so. okay. Right. <laughs> but but uh, is that sort of how you had to retool for this era of customization and moving beyond the PC is having teams who are able to serve a customer need instead of the other way around? Yeah, what, what we're really seeing is um, the need for a lot more deep co-optimization. You know, when you think about you know, we're building a you know foundational chip. Somebody else is building software. Somebody else is building a system. If you do those things independently, it, you're not going to be as good. You're not going to be as efficient. And so, you know, we talk about very deep partnerships and thinking about, hey, what are we trying to do for the world? And then I can decide what do I want to design in the chip. And um, you know, I think those that type of customization is going to continue to be the case because you know you go back to the foundation of the world needs more compute. Now, how do you get the world more compute at you know, you know, the, you know, the best prices, the best performance, the lowest power, the most capability? And, and that, that customization is sort of an outcome you know, of that. So when you think about that, talking about this growth, I, something I asked backstage is, I said, well, you're not as big as Intel yet. And your answer was? Well, I'm, I'm a lot bigger than I was. Right. Okay. <laughs> we're not that. So. We're not that uh, to, to, to be fair, to more be, than fifty percent of Intel now, market to, cap wise. To, to, to be fair, I think um, uh, we uh, growth is so important in the semiconductor industry. All right. What has been their problem for growth then? Because you're, you have been growing. What is they? They've been struggling. Well, I would say the reason why we've been growing is um, I think we, we chose the right markets and um, you know, we, we built just you know, great product. And I know that sounds simple, but I, I do believe it's, it's, as a tech company, it's a, you're, you're very much a product of your roadmap and what you've been able to put on, on board. Um, you know, I have a lot of respect for Intel. They're a great company. But at the same time, you become uh, under scrutiny for, for example, your acquisition. Uh, the impending acquisition of uh, Xilinx. Um, I, you may not be able to talk about it because of a pending merger, but there will be more scrutiny of you, presumably. Well, um, we're very excited about the acquisition of Xilinx. Um, it has, uh, you know, for us, it's back to this notion of we want to be a bigger player in this computing market that's becoming larger. And um, Xilinx brings capabilities that we don't have. It's, they're very complementary. Um, you know, it is true. It's it's a big acquisition, so it's going to get its fair share of, of uh, discussion. Um, you know, I, I will say we've made great progress in uh, getting the um, uh, the acquisition to closure, and you know, we hope to close by the end of this year. But is consolidation inevitable in this industry? Do you see that? Consolidation is inevitable, I would say, um, particularly if you want to make a big impact, right? I mean, startups can do really cool things, but if you know, I've, I've always, I mean, I have tremendous respect for these, these folks who start their own, own companies, but if you want to do something very large for the industry, um, you know, scale is important. Scale so is important. what about these congressional moves toward making consolidation more difficult across industry? And, and a lot of times it's based on the size of your company. And as you mentioned, you're getting bigger. So the time might not be far when, you know, you're above 
you know, you must be this tall to, to ride, you know, <laughs> the, uh, the consolidation roller coaster where you're, you know, you got a size issue when it comes to Congress. Yeah, I, I think the, um, it, it's of course a balance. And, you know, the idea is, is at, at the end of the day, competition is good for all of us. Um, I certainly believe that. And, and part of, you know, our, our thought process has always been, yes, um, you know, we like to design things, uh, you know, with our own components, but we're also designing things, you know, with, uh, with our partner components. Is Congress well. going too far, perhaps? Do they need to be careful? Yeah, I don't know if I would say that. I would just say that I think these are very individual decisions um, that are made as you look at markets and as you look at, you know, sort of how they, how they come together. All right, I want, we're going to get to, uh, to the tech itself. One of the things Lisa said, I really want to talk <laughs> about the future tech, supercomputing, and et cetera. But I think I'd be remiss if I didn't get your thoughts on issues around diversity. You're an immigrant who came to America from Taiwan at the age of two. Um, there's been, obviously, uh, anti-Asian things happening, racial divides in America. You are one of the few female CEOs in the Fortune 500 companies, which I am sorry to say that, but it's the case. Can you give us some thoughts on where you see this going? Yeah, uh, you know, I, I think diversity is always top of mind uh, for me. I think even more so for, um, you know, for us in, in today's world. Um, there are not enough women in tech. I mean, <laughs> state the obvious. Uh, but it is getting better from the standpoint that I think there's more conversation about it. And, you know, my philosophy has always been to work on things that I can impact. And so, um, you know, trying to get, uh, you know, sort of more, you know, women into the pipeline, trying to, to get, give people more opportunity, you know, as they come into engineering. You know, the one thing I like to say about engineering is, like, you know, one of the reasons that I love it is it's very black and white, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, either, you know, the product works or it doesn't work. Um, you know, you don't have to kind of, you know, sell it much um, <laughs> uh, otherwise. And I think that's a very positive thing. So, you know, tr just trying to get more opportunities for, you know, for women and, and, um, and, uh, and sort of underrepresented minorities to see how you, how you can make an impact. As a CEO, how are you managing that out of this pandemic. We, we talk about the great resignation and how that's particularly affecting tech. So often in these periods, we see either women, sometimes very talented women, moving out of the track toward advancement because they're forced to make other choices. Um, are you seeing that potentially within AMD? Are there ways that you're able to answer that? I think what we're seeing is that you know people expect and we can provide um, a lot more flexibility than we did before. Like the mindset has changed, right? We used to think, hey, you know, you know, being, you know, if you're on the fast track, you, you're you're in, you know, the office, whatever, you know, you know, five days a week, you know, twelve hours a day, whatever it is. Um, I think that mindset has changed. Um, I think the mindset has also changed around. Um, it's okay to say that you need to take a break and, you know, the company can work around that. Uh, and, um, and I think that's a good thing. I think the conversation is a very good thing. In Do you have to model that? Do you have to stay home sometimes in order to let other people understand <coughs> what they can? Um, I, I do, and I can't say I don't ever, but I don't as much as I should. <laughs> so. so let's talk about the tech. Talk about where things are going. Let's end up, we have a few minutes, then we'll have questions from the audience, but where do you see what ha what's happening next around supercomputing and other areas that you yes. are focused on? Yes, right, so um, I'm super excited about the technology, and you know, again, I think what's been so interesting for me is we've gone from a period where um, you know, computing perhaps was under the covers, and people didn't really appreciate what you could do, to a place where now it's like, you know, on the front page of the journal or the Times, and people are saying, well, how do I get more chips? And um, what's very exciting is that uh, people used to ask, can you use more computing? Like, do you need more computing? Nobody asks that anymore, right? Um, what you should be asking is, how do I get more and use it more efficiently? And so, um, you know, we're very big on, you know, this notion of, you know, um, John, you mentioned it, you know, sort of, how do you customize you know, computing capability? Like we're building right now uh, with um, Oak Ridge National Labs, um, you know, what we hope to be you know, the fastest supercomputer in the world. And um, honestly, you know, a couple of years ago, we didn't know quite how to do that. 
but we said, hey, that's, that's the, you know, the, the big, big goal, and we're going to find a way to do that, and um, we're making good progress. So, yeah, I, I think you know, computing will help us in every aspect, whether you talk about um, you know, during COVID um, with medical research and you know, vaccine research and modeling around you know, um, you know, climate change and um, you know, all of these things. So, yeah, I, I'm very excited about that. Um, uh, I wonder when you're talking about supercomputing and its role uh, in the ecosystem, is it, is it still setting the bar? Does it have, is it like the Emmys, right? Where if you, if you have the fastest supercomputer, there's a halo effect that further benefits you? Well, I think there's a couple things, right? When you have the fastest supercomputer, um, what you can do is think about now, how many more of these can I build for the next hundred of them, or the next thousand, or the next 10,000? And how do I change the work that you're doing in your data center? And you know, um, you know, we've talked a lot about, John, how you know, cloud is becoming so much more important. You know, supercomputing is now a big thing in the cloud. Like, that never used to be. People used to have to build their own. Now you can rent a supercomputer um, and, uh, and, and really try out your next ideas. So I, I think the, the key there is um, I'm a big believer in if you push the envelope on technology, um, you will get a lot of benefits in sort of more commercial you know, applications. So what is your next push the envelope effort? Um, so, you know, uh, can I be just a little geeky? Just a little? Please, go for it. <laughs> you know, Why we, I had you here? We, we talk about this thing called um, heterogeneous computing. Now, the way I could describe it maybe is, you know, we talk about hybrid cars, right? And hybrid cars are, are cool because, you know, you can, you can use the electric vehicle when you need it and you can yep. use uh, uh, gas when you need it. You know, um, heterogeneous computing is the same thing. It's, it's the idea that, you know, I can build a system for you that will know what you're trying to do and I will use the best compute for what you're doing. And um, I think that's, the big vision of where computing is going, and that's how we get uh, get things sort of a lot more um, a lot more capable. And you know, you hear people talk about the metaverse and you know what happens there. And, and so, uh, yeah, I think that's the next. Do you want a metaverse? Do I want a metaverse? Well, you know, I, I watched Star Trek as a kid. I mean, <laughs> it's like the holodeck, right? It, um, I don't think I could say that I want the metaverse. I would say that that's one of the outcomes of uh, the computing applications that are out there. That, that, you are that you're facilitating. Yeah. So let me ask this, when, when, there's, when you talk about these things, supercomputers, uh, heterogeneous, is it heterogeneous? Yeah, you got it. Computing, it's not that geeky, I get it. Okay. Um, there's also fear about technology, which sort of has been building. Obviously, the government now has moved in, not at you necessarily, but at social media companies and other places. You know, I spent a lot of time having talked about it, and here we are. How do you mitigate that, where you focus in on the good things that it can do? Because tech seems to have lost that narrative. Um, and you all get the people at other companies that are not Facebook slash Twitter slash are like, those assholes, they ruined it for all of us, like kind of thing. I don't know if you think that, um, but how do you get that back, the idea of making things that are like astonishing and helpful to humanity? Well. I, I think um, I think it's you know hindsight is always twenty twenty. I think foresight is what we're trying to get to, and uh, you know the technology capability is there to do amazing things. I think we as you know leaders um, you know need to ensure that what it's doing is great good things and not great you know not so good things. But honestly, Kara, I would say that it. it you know, hindsight's always 2020 on these things. And I think we're learning along the way, right? So this whole conversation of what is good AI, I think we're all learning along the way. And I like to believe that one of the most important thing for us as tech leaders is continue to learn. And that doesn't mean you make every decision correctly, but it means that when you see that something needs to be course corrected, you actually course correct. Well, that would be a fresh new idea from technology. Let's get to questions from the audience. Questions, anybody? Here we go, okay. Michael Miller, PC Magazine. Hi, Lisa. Hi. Uh, 
I'd like to hear you talk a little bit about the change in the enterprise computing market. Yeah. When you took over most of enterprise sales, server sales, you sold to a couple big server companies who sold to, you know, a huge number of customers. Now, over half the business is selling to a handful of big cloud providers. How has that changed how you think about making chips and selling? Yeah, so, uh, you know, the, the data center sort of has <laughs> evolved so much, um, as you said, over the, the last uh, number of years. Um, I think where we see it is, um, you know, the, um, the large cloud companies really are pushing the envelope. Um, they have the ability to move extremely quickly and extremely um, sort of, uh, you know, sort of, um, uh, sort of in that customization type approach. And so we appreciate those deep partnerships. But that being the case, um, you know, I, I think we're all living in a hybrid world where we have our own data centers as well as using the cloud. And so we continue to work uh, with, you know, the large um, number of enterprise customers as well. So I, I think it's just at a, at a different pace is, is what I would say. Here. Howdy. Um, I was uh, curious about uh, how you think about crypto mining on your cards. I know y'all have uh, said that y'all aren't limiting crypto mining on your cards, and but there's uh, rumors that maybe y'all are producing, uh, you know, cards that are specific to crypto mining. How do you think about crypto mining? <coughs> well, I, I would say it's a pretty volatile space. Um, so you think? Just a little. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, as it relates to, to us, I, I would say crypto mining is a, is a small part of our, our business. I mean, you know, some people do use GPUs for things like Ethereum mining, uh, but it's, it's not you know, a large piece of our business. Um, I, I will say that we, we are trying really hard uh, to get um, you know, sort of more products to gamers because you know, gamer, like I, I get so many, you know, dear Lisa, can you help me get a gaming card? So um, there, there's, a, there's a lot of that out there, but our focus is much more on the core business and, and not so much on crypto. Should it be on crypto? Um, I don't believe it should. You know, I don't believe it should. I think it's a, like, like I said, it's a very volatile space. And, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we're, we're building for sort of, um, you know, sort of, in this case, consumer applications, and that's where the focus is. Do you help them get a gaming card when they write you directly? Yeah, or a PS5. Or um, I, I do try when I can. Okay. <laughs> okay. Over Thank here, you. last question. Hi, Lisa. Um, curious about what more. the semiconductor industry is doing around carbon footprint. Um, is it even something that you can make an impact in? Because as you continue to make things more efficient, then people just want more power. So I'm just curious the, uh, the approach that you all are taking. Yeah, actually, it's a great question. Um, we absolutely can do something about the carbon footprint. I think the semiconductor industry, you know, when you think about, you know, sort of our goals, and, and, and they're very aligned with the notion of we want to make computing more efficient, which is more performance, less power, less emissions. And, um, you know, we have some goals that, you know, we set for our products uh, that, uh, you know, uh, we're just about to announce a goal that, that says by 2025, we want to be 30x more efficient than we are today. So absolutely, the industry can participate, should participate, and um, it's something that's, uh, that, that's uh, top of mind. Over here. Hi, thanks Dr. Lisa for your sharing. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, I know you've talked about running faster than your competition and that being very important. Can I understand where does packaging fit in for you? Because we're talking a lot about front end and we're talking about <laughs> wafer fabrication. Where does fa packaging fit in in the next 10 years for you? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I think the, um, when we think about, you know, this whole conversation of Moore's Law and Moore's Law slowing, you have to think about different ways of innovating, and packaging is one of those very, very important ways of innovating. So, you know, we've been very focused on that, and we'll continue to be very focused on that as a way to sort of back to how do we make computing more efficient. Um, I think it's investing in, you know, design, um, you know, partnering with manufacturing, as well as innovating in packaging. Great question. Yeah, Michael Charlene, Bain & Company. Um, yeah, under your leadership, AMD has performed an amazing turnaround. And I think you, you mentioned uh, that you developed the world's best roadmap and then patiently executed for four to five years. Uh, but there must be more to it. That's incredibly hard, right? How, how did you keep the teams together in a competitive environment uh, such as Silicon Valley, where you have hiring left and right, or how did you deal with uh, setbacks that you naturally have over such a long R&D cycle? Well, it's uh, it's a good question. I I think you find people who really 
want to do this work, and that's not everyone, right? So when I think about um, you know what uh, what has really motivated um, our team, me, I mean it's 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 about building you know sort of the world's greatest um, you know sort of microprocessors and, and graphics processors, uh, but it takes time, and and so there it, there are some people that that's not good enough for, and that's okay. Uh, but I think staying consistent is very, very important. I mean, one of the, the things that I, I've learned is, you know, if you change your mind every two seconds, you're not going to get what you want. So, um, you know, really staying consistent with, you know, sort of vision, strategy, roadmap. And, and um, you know, at the end of the day, though, I tell my team we're only as good as our current product. So we, we still have a lot to prove and we still have a lot, uh, a lot to do. The, the, uh, but um, it's, 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 a great, uh, it's a great feeling to be able to um, you know, build things that make the world a better place. And of course, she could have just said, I rock, aren't, don't, aren't I amazing? <laughs> but then? I don't think I could have said that. Really? But, yeah. Not just a little bit? Uh, I don't know. OK. <laughs> Everyone should know Lisa Zhu. Lisa, thank you so much. Thank you.